Good afternoon. Western University is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Luna, Piwak, and the Adam peoples, who have long-standing relationships to the land and the region of southwestern Ontario and the city of London. The local First Nations communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. In the region, there are 11 First Nation communities and a growing indigenous urban population. Western values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, also known as North America. Good afternoon. As some of you know, I'm Patrick Mann, director of SASA, the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities here at Western. It's a pleasure to welcome you, our honored guests, colleagues, students, to this first iteration of our new SASA speaker series. Before I welcome Dean Michael Mildy, who will introduce Alice Munro, Chair in Creativity, the singular author, Nino Ricci, I want to say a few words about our program and about this series. SASA, many of you know us already, and I believe that you and others in and beyond the university are going to come to know us better in the months and years ahead. Recently, we adopted the headline, Learning with Humanity. Because we want to signal that we're a program that values learning in its many forms and contexts as a key to human well-being, an activity and a process that must be sustained throughout our lives and therefore becomes sustaining. In essence, our line echoes the assertion by John Dewey that, quote, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself, close quote. To be a bit more specific about who we are and what we do, our new strategic plan says, and this is brief, SASA is a nationally recognized undergraduate program focused on an interdisciplinary education centered both within and beyond the arts and humanities. We're committed to inspiring and promoting innovation in teaching, creativity and community engagement, and to producing ethical, knowledgeable citizens, capable of leadership and of meeting the challenges of the contemporary world. Now that might sound like institutional spin, but if you meet our students, and I hope you do if you haven't, if you witness our courses and committed faculty leading them, and generally keep up with what's going on at SASA, you'll know we're serious about it. Now about the speaker series, very briefly. Last year I had a lot of conversations with our advisory council, our faculty and university leaders, with our students and other friends of SASA, in order to do some thinking together and planning. In the midst of it, a group of us made a bus trip to a meeting in Toronto, and on that trip, Gabriella Solti, an artist and consultant who was helping us with the process, was scanning an article when she came across the line, technologize the future. And she turned to me and asked, what about humanize the future? What a great question. For at SASA, though we're not at all interested in resisting change, or living in fear of technological advances, we are committed to the idea that we in the humanities have a special role to play in helping build an engaged intellectual and creative community for future humans and context of contributing to the health of the planet. So the theme of this speaker series, Humanize the Future, is meant to invoke a set of interrelated concerns that we hope will resonate with our times. As I've implied already, we know that our experience of the future will be increasingly determined by new technologies, and specifically that artificial intelligence will foster tremendous change, as it has already begun to do. In light of this, we ask, how will the human be understood, and what will be the opportunities for humanity that a te technologized world offers? Alongside this, we wonder, how the traditional aspirations and practices of the humanities will move forward to help sustain the needs and desires of people, 
while also enabling us to acknowledge that we live alongside the other than human? And how will our humanity look in a world where we need to be increasingly accountable in important and often new ways? Now, just to assure Nino, uh, we know that these big questions will not be answered directly by our speakers. We are certain that each, however, will contribute to the opportunity to develop frames of thought and reference that will help us think and imagine the future productively. As a final note, before I introduce Michael, I'll add that in the spirit of creating a conversation about these things that I've been alluding to, after Nino's talk, two of our SASA students will begin the Q&A with a question or two. Misha Appel and Nicole Burnett uh, through their queries for Nino, are going to help us think further about how together we will humanize the future. Now it's my great pleasure to hand things over to Dean of Arts, Michael Milde, who has the honor of introducing Nino Ricci. Thank you, Patrick. And it's a great pleasure to be here and to introduce Nino, but I'm going to say just a couple of words about the Alice Munro Chair in Creativity, uh, where, wherein uh, Nino is the inaugural holder of that chair. So uh, how many people here have heard of Alice Munro? Yeah. And if you haven't, go Google her right now. Alice Munro is uh, a Canadian treasure and a, a local girl uh, who grew up uh, not far from London in a, in a town called Wingham. And uh, she did a little bit of writing here at Western in 1950 and 51, uh, when she was a student here. And she did very well for herself, becoming a famous writer and uh, becoming a writer in residence here in 1974-75. And won one or two awards and then went on to win uh, the Nobel Prize in 2013. It was really that Nobel Prize that was the inspiration for us to uh, get a name chair. And we, uh, with the help of many uh, donors and friends of Arts and Humanities, we brought together enough money to uh, put together the chair in creativity to celebrate Alice Munro's creativity and to help foster creativity here in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Western. So it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Nino uh, Ricci as our inaugural chair. Sorry, I need my glasses for this part. And uh, really an, an exemplary uh, inaugural chair. He is, without question, one of Canada's most accomplished novelists. He's originally from Leamington, Ontario, and his work has garnered attention across Canada and around the world. His debut novel, The Lives of the Saints, was an instant success, earning him his first Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction. The Lives of the Saints was the first book in a trilogy that included In a Glass House and Where She Has Gone. Where She Has Gone was shortlisted for the prestigious Giller Prize and the trilogy was turned into a TV miniseries, miniseries starring Sophia Loren. Nino's other works include Testament and The Origin of Species. Happily, it's not the same stuff that you get on there. I've got a few other things here. And The Origin of Species, which earned him his second Governor General's Award for Fiction. He's also the author of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, a short biography of the Prime Minister that has received accolades for its insights and, not surprisingly, for the quality of its writing. In addition to the Governor General Award, General's Awards, his work has been awarded two Canadian Authors for Fiction Awards, the Trillium Prize, and the Alistair MacLeod Award for Literary Achievement. Among other public roles, Nino has been a director and president of Penn Canada, a writer's organization that advocates freedom of expression. In 2011, he became a member of the Order of Canada, and on July 1st, he became the Alice Munro Chair in Creativity. Please welcome to the podium, Nino Ricci. Green, yeah. now? Yeah, okay, there we go. If, if you'd only told me all those questions, I would have answered them. <laughs> uh, as it is, um, I might 
touch on a few. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Milda and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Western for the opportunity to serve as the inaugural holder of the Alice Munro Chair, uh, and Professor Ma uh, Mann and the School of Advanced Studies for inviting me here to speak to you today. As I sit elsewhere, my own origins in southwestern Ontario have meant that Western has always occupied a, a, a very special place in my pantheon of academic institutions, and it's an honor to be part of the university, uh, particularly to be holding uh, a chair named for a writer who's been both uh, a great uh, influence and a great inspiration to me. Uh, over the years, I've discovered that one of the hazards of giving talks of this sort is that almost invariably, you're required to come up with a title for the talk long before you have any idea what you're actually going to say. I did, in fact, have what seemed like a very clear idea in my mind when I came up for the title for today's talk, but inevitably, as soon as I sat down to write the thing, that clarity instantly gave way to the usual fog that sets in Whenever I leave the little room in my brain that is ready to generate any number of seemingly brilliant ideas and go down to the murky workshop where those ideas then need to get engineered into actual working entities. The next thing that happened is also what usually happens, panic. I started thinking of other ideas, then started going through former talks I'd given to see if any of them would do, then started pillaging pell-mell from every talk I'd ever given. It was only well into this process that I realized I got caught in a kind of reflexive loop, for the very act of trying to write my talk had morphed into its subject. There I was again, as I have been in almost every creative task I've ever undertaken, stuck in that shadow land between the conception and the final product, trying to muddle through. What I'm going to talk about today, then, is exactly that tortuous path like the all of us have traveled in our own work in trying to move from inspiration to completion, a path strewn with many pitfalls and blind alleys and wrong turns, and it almost invariably leads you to a place that is never quite the one you thought you were setting out for. And in talking about that process, one that in many ways runs counter to the standard teaching model of most educational institutions, I hope to suggest a paradigm that might have broader pedagogical implications, particularly in an age when terms like creativity and originality and innovation have become buzzwords across practically every discipline and field of endeavor. I should admit that until not long ago, I was the sort of person who would want to leave the room whenever a phrase like creative process came up. In this, I was probably not alone among fellow writers and artists. Some of this resistance has come as a reaction against the stream of new agey self-help books on the creative process that began coming out in the 1970s and 80s, and that has been running at full current ever since. Books that often seem to reduce the creative process to a kind of formula that bears little relation to the actual experience of most creators. But perhaps a bigger part of the resistance is the fear that trying to look too closely at the creative process might somehow sabotage it. And usually tied up in that fear is the suspicion that one's own process, in particular, is no process at all but a mix of such muddled half-steps and time-wasting and superstitious ritualism that it could only invite ridicule. Nowadays, though, with empirical studies of creativity becoming ever more common, and with neuroscience beginning to chart creativity's pathways in the brain right down to the level of single neurons, it's becoming much harder for artists to keep up a protective veil around the mystery of process. But here is the good news coming out of most of this research, that the creative process, far from following any of the neat models that even serious writers on the subject have tried to reduce it to in the past, is instead most clearly characterized by its very resistance to such schemes. Characterized, that is, by its very unpredictability, an unpredictability that often involves muddled half-steps and time-wasting and superstitious ritualism, as well as many pitfalls, blind alleys, and wrong turns. In their book, Wired to Create, Scott Kaufman and Carolyn Gregoire analyzed the process by which Picasso, for instance, came to paint his masterwork, Guernica. Asked to create a mural for the 1937 World's Fair in Paris, he spent months doing mostly uninspired sketches around the oft-repeated theme of the artist's studio, 
But then he abandoned the idea for a new one after reading an account of the then recent bombing of the small Basque town of Guernica in the ongoing Spanish Civil War. Over the next month, he completed some 45 sketches that included numerous versions of the various figures that would eventually appear in the final painting. In some cases, it was the earliest versions of the figures that ended up making the cut. In other cases, later ones. In some cases, the figures in the sketches were wildly different from anything that showed up in the painting. Even after he moved onto the canvas, he continued experimenting with new figures, often painting over ones he had already finished. Picasso was a seasoned artist by then, with many masterpieces under his belt, and yet his artistic process remained fairly chaotic, with many false starts and much backtracking and little evidence that he himself had any re clear idea where he was going until he got there. Such a process, of course, runs counter to the model most of us are taught for completing tasks. One that encourages a linear progression towards clear goals and that privileges the rational over the intuitive, the conscious over the unconscious, the definite over the ambiguous. And yet, it is almost always the latter forces that are crucial in the creative process, along with the willingness to remain in uncertainty about where you are headed, as the distance between starting and end point can often be vast. Vladimir Nabokov, for instance, described the initial shiver of inspiration, as he put it, for his infamous novel Lolita as being prompted by a newspaper story about an ape in the Paris Zoo that had produced the first drawing ever penned by an animal, a sketch that showed the bars of its cage. Somehow, Nabokov would have us believe this unlikely source would lead years later to a novel about a middle-aged European pedophile who holds his young stepdaughter captive across the motels of America for the purpose of satisfying his lusts. When I first read his explanation as an undergrad, I suspected he was having us on, engaging in that evasiveness about process which most artists are given to. And yet, when I came to write my own first novel, it had a trajectory no less unlikely and convoluted. That novel, Lives of the Saints, is set in a village in the Italian Apennines in the 1960s and tells the story of a woman who commits adultery while her husband is working overseas. I began writing it in the spring of 1985 and used a version of it as a thesis for a master in creative writing two and a half years later before finally finding a publisher for a revised version of it three years after that. The original inspiration for it, however, went back six or seven years before I started it to a piece of erotica I had considered writing as an undergrad to earn some quick cash about an incestuous relationship between a brother and sister. I never wrote that piece, but for some reason the idea stayed with me, and when the time came to start my master's thesis, I began to wonder if it might form the basis for a novel. To moderate the incest element and add credibility, I thought of making the siblings only half-siblings and of making the sister the product of an affair. That got me wondering how much I actually knew about adultery, given that it wasn't very common, at least as far as I had been told, in the rather tight-knit Italian community I had grown up in. But then I remembered a book I had read about a village in southern Italy where illegitimacy had in fact become quite widespread because wives were often separated from their husbands for years while their husbands worked overseas. From there, the whole novel suddenly unfolded in my head as a kind of seamless spool, or rather, what at that point I was still thinking of as merely a sort of prologue to the novel about the brother and sister. And so, from a story I had initially imagined as set in contemporary Canada, I now found myself in a small Italian village in the year 1960 with a mother who hadn't even been part of the original idea. As I started writing about her, she slowly began to take over the, the story entirely until she had managed to relegate the brother and sister story to the third volume of what eventually became a trilogy. A curious thing about this whole process was that as a young writer, the last thing I wanted to write about was my own immigrant experience. This was at a time when a great deal of lip service was being paid in this country to the official policy of multiculturalism, but when its practical manifestations were mainly in ethnic folk festivals that ended up reinforcing ethnic stereotypes rather than challenging them. In the literary world, the label of ethnic meant being consigned to a little corner of a territory that was itself 
already heavily ghettoized, namely Canadian literature, which at the time, for instance, was not even included in the general fiction section in bookstores, but was relegated to a special shelf called Canadiana, where it mostly languished unread. The specter of such double ghettoization had meant that before I started Lives of the Saints, most of my work had consisted of short stories set in a kind of cultural void, with characters with names like Alex and Mary that betrayed no sign of any immigrant origin. And yet my background, for better or worse, was what I was stuck with, and somehow my imagination turned out to be smarter than I was, managing to find the way to take my original inspiration and use it to open up in me a vein of material that ended up yielding, incre yielding incredible riches. In this way, a short piece of erotica had turned into a novel, then the novel had turned into a trilogy. At the time, I didn't even know what a trilogy was or what rules might govern one. All I knew after I'd finished the first draft of the entire story was that I had far too much material to hope to graduate before I reached the term limit for my master's program. I therefore petitioned, petitioned to divide the story into three parts and to submit only the first part as my thesis. And so a trilogy was born. Along the way, of course, there were any number of false starts and blind alleys and wrong turns. Early drafts of the story, for instance, contain an extensive appendix on forms of suicide as well as astrological birth charts for all of the major characters. As it happened, I was very much under the influence at the time of Freud and of postmodern theory as well as of Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, and all these influences still figured very prominently in the thesis version of the novel that I submitted to graduate. Luckily, not long after graduation, I gave a copy of the manuscript to my girlfriend's mother to read, and all those Freudian and Pinchonian and postmodernist passages that had got past my thesis committee now came back to me flagged with little sticky notes with big question marks on them. <laughs> this spurred me to a wholesale revision of the book, in which I whittled it down by a third to the version that was eventually published. In the process, there was a lot of material over which I had agonized for weeks or months that ended up on the cutting room floor, some of it quite amusing and clever. Yet somehow, this final ruthless edit was the easiest part of the whole process. For by this stage, I could finally see clearly the story I hadn't known I had intended to tell all along. Another curious thing about that first novel, however, was that though it represented, in a way, my reowning of my own cultural roots, probably my greatest unease as I was writing it was whether I had the authority to do so. I should point out that this was well before any of the appropriation of voice debates that have now become common. My question, rather, was a practical one. Given that at that point in my life I had spent at most a total of perhaps three months in Italy, and only about half of that time in villages of the sort of in which Lives of the Saint is mostly set, what made me think I could write about such a world with any accuracy? As it turned out, once I started writing, it seemed I knew a lot more about that world than I thought I had, partly through the visits I'd made there, and partly through my upbringing, and partly through reading and research I'd done over the years in one form or another. And yet I still vividly remember speaking at an event in my parents' home region when the book came out in Italian and gazing out at the faces of my uncles and aunts and cousins in the audience and suddenly wondering at the arrogance of what I had done. These were people who knew these villages and this culture deep in their bones, whose history there went back millennia, and all I had as credentials was my book learning and my few weeks of casual visits. And yet, at the same time, I was glad of the innocence that had let me push on regardless. This, too, is part of the creative process, the, that the imagination has a way of pushing through to understanding. And even though its papers might not quite be in order, it needs to be left free to slip across every frontier if it is to enter the unknown territory that it doesn't quite know is its goal. I suspect that part of that goal for me, though I certainly couldn't have articulated this at the time, was to try to find a way to understand my own cultural background outside the narrowing lens of a marginalized ethnicity. By starting my story in Italy, where my characters didn't have to think of themselves 
as part of an ethnic minority, I was in some sense left free to leave their Italianness out of the picture and to think of them merely as fully human with all the diversity and possibility that implied. The messiness that marked the creation of my first book and the circuitousness by which I finally came around to understand what it was I was trying to get at has indeed marked all of my books. If anything, the messiness has only gotten worse over the years as my projects have become more ambitious and the amount of raw material I've had to sift through has grown vaster. So too have the false starts and wrong turns in blind alleys. My tendency, of course, is always to think that if only I was smarter or more disciplined or more insightful, I'd be able to get my books written more efficiently. And I suspect this is a tendency a lot of us have, in part again because it is one that is encouraged by our education system. There is very little room for messiness in the standard educational model. There is very little room for trial and error. The most, most rewarded path is almost always the one that moves most quickly from clear problem to clear solution. And this is true not only in fields like business and the sciences, but even in the arts. Creative writing programs, for instance, which have seen exponential growth in recent years, tend to favor poetry and short fiction over novels or other longer forms, not because students prefer those forms, but because they better lend themselves to goal and grade-oriented teaching. In writing workshops, critiques tend to focus on suggestions for improvement, again out of a goal-oriented notion that a piece can move along some straight line of fixability toward a foreseeable, successful final product, when the truth is that creation seldom moves along a straight line and seldom has a clear idea where it is going. My own experience of uh, workshops as a student, in fact, was that I was rarely able to return to a piece of work once it had been workshopped as it seemed contaminated somehow, precisely because the barrage of well-intentioned critique had drowned out the small, quiet voice at the back of my head that had made me want to write the piece in the first place. Whatever hope I have for moving forward in a piece of writing always seems to depend on tuning into that quiet voice. The further I get from it, the more work feels dead. The closer to it, and the more even problems that seemed intractable at first fall away. Ideally, then, writing workshops would only about be about helping writers hear that voice more clearly, rather than about making piecemeal corrections to a story that in some future, truer draft might have found its own very different solutions. In my teaching practice, as a result, I have tried to move away from a model that takes this crucial element of the creative process into uh, sorry, move toward a model that takes this crucial element of the creative process into greater account, looking at pieces more globally and trying to encourage writers to listen to their intuitions and keep true to their own vision. Even so, I've yet to find a method I'm completely satisfied with. For one thing, it's pretty hard to know what might be in a writer's mind that for whatever reason isn't getting out on paper, or to figure out what kind of comment might help writers better understand their own intentions. For another, by the end of term, I have to come up with some sort of final grade, and one based on a set of reasonably objective criteria. Anne Lamont, as uh, my students know, in her classic book on writing, Bird by Bird, extols the virtues of writing what she calls a shitty first draft, one where you s still have only the barest notion where you are going and are simply trying to get the story out in whatever form it comes to you. Almost every writer writes such drafts, and as bad as they are, they almost invariably end up providing the blueprint for everything that follows. Ideally, then, a creative writing class on a novel, say, such as the one I'm teaching this term, would consist mostly of students spending their time writing their shitty first draft. As the primary conditions of uh, shitty first drafts, however, is that they be shitty and that they need be shown to no one and hence can be written without overthinking and without fear of judgment, they wouldn't provide much basis for awarding a final grade. This is not to say that students won't learn all sorts of useful things in writing workshops, as the learning outcomes sections of our course outlines attest to. They'll learn technical skills and editing skills. They'll learn what works in a story and what doesn't. They'll learn, perhaps, about the subtle places you can get to in a piece of writing that they hadn't ever thought about trying to get to. 
But no matter how many times I encourage them to write their shitty first drafts and to trust their intuitions and to set aside their editing impulse, they still have to produce pieces of writing that they know will be read and judged by their fellow classmates and will be graded by their instructor. Which means that often the creative process will get curbed long before it has a, truly had a chance to kick into full gear. It also means that for the many students in creative writing classes who won't go on to be professional writers, they are getting shortchanged on a skill that would be extremely useful to them in whatever field they ended up choosing, that of accessing their own creativity. Creativity expert and TED Talk darling Ken Robinson has made the point that while from an early age education systems do everything they can to discourage us from making mistakes, it is a very willingness to make mistakes that is at the core of creativity. Hence those shitty first drafts, hence those false starts and blind alleys and wrong turns. As William Blake put it, you never know what is enough unless you know what is more than enough. Samuel Beckett put it slightly differently in his novella, Worst Word Ho, in lines that have lately become the mantra of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. It's useful to ask, of course, what exactly all this messiness and failure is doing that seems to make it so necessary to creativity. One way of answering the question, perhaps, is by looking at successful creations and figuring out what it is we get from them. Some years ago, at a trial pitting Canada Customs against Vancouver's Little Sisters bookstore, I was asked to do just that, called in as an expert with witness to discuss the literary merit of some of the books that Customs had seized on their way to the bookstore because they had judged them to be obscene. I was surprised at the time, not only by how little hard thought I myself had given before then to what criteria might determine such a murky thing as literary merit, but by how few resources I could lay my hands on which might have helped me in developing some. Of the various criteria I eventually came up with, the one that seemed most to go to the heart of the matter was one I labeled complexity. By this I meant the extent to which a work tries to build in a level of interconnectedness and detail and nuance that gives an intimation, at least, of the impossible complexity of the world. This notion has a lot to do with why I bother to write at all, out of a hope at bottom of somehow fitting in the whole of creation so that every bit of light is shaded with the million wavelengths of it we can't quite see, every bit of truth with the million qualifications of it we can't know. And no list could hold what I wanted, Alice Munro writes at the end of Lives of Girls and Women in a passage that has long served me as a kind of manifesto. For what I wanted was every last thing, every layer of speech and thought, stroke of light on bark or walls, every smell, pothole, pain, crack, delusion, held still and held together, radiant, everlasting. As it happens, complexity, too, turns out to be an essential quality of the creative process, not only in its ends, but in its means, in the way it pilfers from every field and questions every assumption and dares unusual connections and then reconstitutes the world in a way that lets us see it differently and more fully. Creative breakthroughs are exactly those that end up peeling back a layer on the world's complexity. And because the complexity they aim to get at is itself such a web of nearly infinite forces where those that still escape our understanding vastly outnumber the handful that are safely categorized and known, it is only by mustering all our resources and by attempting every avenue and questioning every belief that we can hope to get at it. In an article I wrote recently for an anthology on the future of Canadian literature, I suggested that in the celebrity death match between the arts and the sciences, the arts have traditionally had the upper hand. We can still turn to the epic of Gil Gilgamesh for truths about being human, for instance, while science, for much of its history, has been getting most everything wrong, still maintaining well into the 15th century that the earth was at the center of the universe, and into the 19th that God had created the universe whole cloth in or around 4004 BC. Fast forward to the present, however, and art and science seem to be neck and neck with science beginning to set up shop in territory 
that once only the arts dared to enter. Evolutionary psychology, for instance, has revealed ophidian corners of the human brain that have left even writers aghast. While current brain projects envision delivering a fully functioning reverse engineered silicon brain by 2030, one that might not only be able to reproduce the subtle shifts of mind that literature has always made its stock and trade, but to track and explain them. And yet, what we are seeing in, in this new overlap is perhaps merely something that has always been true. That there has always been a much greater complementarity between the arts and the sciences than is generally acknowledged. One of the courses that proved most helpful to me as an undergrad in my study of literature was a science course that traced the nature and growth of scientific thought from the ancient Greeks to quantum mechanics. It helped me to see how in every era there is always a fairly direct correlation between the arts and sciences with breakthroughs in each feeding off of and into the other. No doubt that's because in both fields in the end they rely on the same sort of creative thinking for their breakthroughs and insights. If the arts continue to have an advantage, however, it is that they have always placed creativity at their center. Whereas the sciences, whatever lip service they might pay, have tended to regard it with deep skepticism. The history of science continues to show that almost every major advance was initially greeted with skepticism or outright hostility. <coughs> Charles Darwin, whose insight on natural selection came about in the usual messy way of such insights as a result of taking a trip to the Galapagos the, that he had undertaken merely to put off making decisions about his future and on having a professional shooter along with him who took the trouble to label his specimens carefully and on happening to read an essay on population by Thomas Malthus, Malthus held off making his insight public for two decades because he knew he would be, be denounced by all the men of science who had earlier been his mentors. Yet his theory now forms the bedrock of our understanding of the natural world. Similarly, the notion of brain plasticity was dismissed as nonsense when it was first proposed nearly 100 years ago. Yet in recent years, it has revolutionized our understanding of the brain and its capabilities. Science often commits the hubris of thinking that the scientific method gives it some sort of privileged access to the truth. And yet the fact is that it continues to get things wrong. Otherwise, the sorts of ongoing paradigm shifts that people like Thomas Kuhn have charted would cease to be necessary. Nor is there any shortage of unknowns on which the scientific method is yet to shed any light, and which the imagination will surely have to play a large role in getting to the bottom of. Consider, for instance, that scientists now acknowledge that perhaps 85% of the universe is composed of so-called dark matter, a substance that is yet to be isolated and about which they can say very little for certain. And this is to say nothing of the unknown unknowns which the future will surely eventually open up to us. We live in times in which the need for creativity and insight has perhaps never been greater. Students entering university today do so in a world that in perhaps five or ten years may already be radically different from the one they live in now, requiring different skills and different knowledge and different training. One thing we can be sure of, however, is that it will require creative solutions, and we ignore at our peril the job of rethinking our educational structures and practices so that they work to breed creativity rather than suppress it. I've been very heartened so far by the many initiatives I've seen at Western to address these very issues, among them the SASA program, and hope that during my time in the Alice Munro chair, I'll be able to contribute in some small way to that process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nino. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Nicole, and uh, who is going to ask a question. 
Um, do you consider how a future audience might interact with your novel, and does this influence how you write? Uh, it, it, um, it certainly scares me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I think we, I mean, every age thinks that it's at a turning point moment. You, I mean, you go through history and there, you're starting with Socrates and before people complain, you know, people don't read books anymore, they don't read poetry, they, everything's changing, we're at an end time. Uh, you know, Sir Philip Fid Sidney in, in, in his defense of poetry complained that, you know, poetry had, you know, had fallen to the lowest level. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, Shakespeare was just up the street uh, penning his sonnets and writing his, his play. So clearly, uh, the end time had not arrived. Uh, and certainly, people tend to speak that way now uh, about literature and the written word. People don't read as much now, or they don't access text in the same ways as they used to. They don't access the same kinds of texts as they used to. Uh, so, uh, so it may in fact be that something, uh, we may in fact be in, in one of those turning point moments. Um, uh, I, I think a useful parallel is, uh, you know, the invention of the, the printing press, the Gutenberg press. Uh, it did end up having very radical consequences. Uh, uh, you know, interestingly, when it first came out, the first printed books looked a lot like illuminated manuscripts because everyone thought, well, that's what a book is supposed to look like. And so they still had illustrations, they still used the, you know, the Gothic script that looked like handwritten script. Uh, and then eventually people really realized, well, a book can, you know, look like anything that a pin printing press can, can handle. And, um, and, uh, uh, and the, you know, the era of, of mass market production ushered in all kinds of uh, very profound social, social, social and political changes. It, it allowed people to read the Bible, for instance, from which we get the Reformation, from which we get the Counter-Reformation, from which we get some 300 years of religious wars, uh, uh, some of which are still going on to this day. Uh, it ushered in the possibility of, uh, of people buying books. Uh, from which came the novel, from which came um, you know, increasingly widespread education, from which came people uh, uh, you know, vying for political rights, from which came democracy. Uh, so uh, it's certainly true that you know, a changing piece of technology can have vast repercussions. And you know, we're in an era where uh, we're seeing a lot of new technology. So, uh, you know, will the fact that, that people now can read e-texts uh, change how the novel is received? Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure how it will affect um, how people read a no whether it makes a difference if you read a novel as an e-book or if you read it in print. But I do think that eventually people will say, well, well why are we reading a novel? Uh, you know, this thing can do all kinds of things. Uh, it can show me pictures, it can show me movies, it can do, you know, five things at once. Why don't I make something that takes advantage of those possibilities, as opposed to, you know, something that's still based on the Gutenberg press. Uh, so that will happen. Uh, it, it, there's no way of stopping that kind of development. Uh, so we, you know, people have been talking about the death of the novel for four decades. It may be that we're getting closer uh, because technology now allows people to access media differently, and and people will do that. Uh, you know, McLuhan said the medium is the message. Uh, there still seems truth in that. Uh, uh, people uh, make TV shows because they're. TVs. Uh, they wouldn't make them if TVs didn't exist. Uh, so, uh, so I do, I mean, I do sometimes have this feeling that, you know, I may be among the, some of the final generations of, uh, uh, of novel writing as we have understood it. At the same time, uh, storytelling continues in every form uh, in our society. That's not going away. Uh, and in fact, it seems to have gone viral. Uh, you know, a lot of people, one of the points I made in that essay I referred to is that, you know, a lot of people, people like me, 
uh, instead of reading a novel on the weekend, they watch, you know, Netflix. They watch the newest Netflix serial. Why? Because often it's good. Uh, and often it does, you know, exactly the things that we look for in novels. It tells the, you know, credible stories of complex characters facing real life situations, uh, which is what novels do. Uh, something has changed, that, you know, the, the, they don't have, you don't get the sensitivity to language that in a, in a Netflix series, you're never going to get it, that you could in a, you know, in a well-written novel. Uh, but, uh, you know, the average person who is looking to access some way of understanding the, the world, who used to turn to a novel, uh, m is more likely going to turn to a Netflix series if it's doing the job as well. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think that you know, uh, creators are going to are going to have to learn to multitask and uh, and and adapt to a new media environment and uh, in some ways learn to do the thing that we've been doing you know since Homer and Gilgamesh, uh, but to do it in ways that take advantage of the, the media that are available to us. So, you know, my novels might be, I mean, I, I don't know how many of them, how, how much hard copy will, will even exist in the future because, it, you know, the trouble of storing it. But it, may, it will exist somewhere in some data bank that, that researchers will, will refer back to in the way that, uh, you know, we, you know, how many people pick up uh, uh, Beowulf nowadays just, I mean, in fact they do. It was, that's the amazing thing is that, you know, when a Seamus Heaney gives us a Beowulf, pe pe the public does read it or the public does read a new uh, Iliad. So there will be those works that will carry on that way. Uh, uh, but, uh, but the majority fall away as, as happens in, in every age as people move toward uh, you know, people are much more likely to go see Brad Pitt doing the Iliad than to read the Iliad. Let's face it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that movie got a lot more hits than Homer's getting. Um, so, yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> that also answered mine. So I came up with a new one. Uh, so considering the fight that you were discussing between arts and STEM disciplines, how do you think that we will adapt to people from science backgrounds now holding traditional humanities positions? And do you have any advice to deal with the shifting culture for arts and humanities students? Uh, repeat that question to me. Of course. There, first of all, what is the acronym STEM? Stand okay, for? I'm not going to get this right. Science, does anyone know it? Technology, engineering, math. Okay, all right. I was forgetting technology. Right. I'll repeat it. Okay, so considering the fight between arts and the STEM disciplines that you were mentioning earlier, uh -huh. how do you think that we will adapt um, to people from like the science backgrounds now holding traditional humanities jobs yeah. or positions? Uh, well, I don't know. I, we're, we're very slow to adapt. Uh, I mean, it's odd. As, as, a, as a species, we're, we're very smart and, and very imaginative, and yet, you know, societies as a whole move, move slowly, and people get entrenched, and, uh, and institutions get entrenched. Uh, so, and it's wrong, really, to hope for uh, radical change overnight, because, you know, you look at history, whenever radical change has happened overnight, it's always gone badly. Uh, uh, because people are bad, uh, and uh, you know, you have a revolution. Guess what? Uh, the poor don't actually get the land. The the you know the avant-garde gets the land. Okay, but someday you'll get the land. Um, uh, so you know, so we have to we have to work out some kind of evolutionary process that moves us forward at least. Every little step forward uh, helps, and I think. Uh, you know, programs like SASA, which, which ask those questions. Uh, 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 Westerns, you know, getting students out into the community and, and, and doing sort of alternative forms of learning. I mean, that's, these are great things. Uh, uh, you know, one of the point that, uh, 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 that Ken Robinson guy makes is that, you know, you, you learn through activity. Uh, uh, that's, 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 y your brain actually w starts working differently. Uh, when you're out there confronting someone and having to do something in the real world is much different than sitting in a classroom and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, absorbing uh, information. 
Uh, so, so every initiative uh, in that direction helps, and all those initiatives can happen in the sciences uh, as much as in the arts. And you know, I think connections have to start to happen uh, among those disciplines. Uh, there was a book I read uh, some years ago by Edward O. Wilson, the, uh, the entomologist, sociobiologist, sort of everything guy, uh, 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 that was about uh, joining all fields of knowledge, finding a common language for all fields of knowledge. Um, I mean, some aspects of that book were delusional. I mean, he, he made the comment that we're now at the point where we know almost everything. Like, anyone who can say that <laughs> is clearly living in a different universe than I live in. Uh, and yet, a lot of the points that he made were good ones about the siloing of disciplines. You know, disciplines silo themselves with their language. You know, I'm the only one who understands this language. So, you know, you can't come in. Uh, so, so even beginning to think about common languages uh, across disciplines and breaking down some of the, the jargon barriers that, that, that separate them and realizing that there are points of connection, that in fact the arts can be understood in scientific ways. As scary as that is for artists who have always wanted to maintain this, this mystical wall around what artists do, uh, well, no, it's a human activity. Uh, like any other human activity, it has evolutionary roots, like, like every activity. It's hard to imagine why evolution thought that writing novels would be good for, human, for the human race, but it turns out to be good for them. Uh, and, and, um, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the, the storytelling gene seems to be, you know, deeply rooted in the animal kingdom as well. You know, bees that give dances show where the honey is. Uh, mating, the mating dances of birds. Uh, I, remember being, I remember being in the Galapagos when I was doing research for a novel and watching the masked booby do the mating uh, dance. And, and the male will come and he'll bring a stick and put it in front of the female and then he'll bring a stone and, uh, and, and put it in front of the female and then he'll kind of sing a little song. He's telling a story, you know? He says, you know, come with me and I'll, I'll feed you, I'll build you a house, and we'll make great love together. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't see any other way of reading why, you know, what's going on in that, that interaction. Uh, uh, so I think there are all kinds of ways that, that you know, these warring entities can, can talk to each other and, and uh, learn from each other. The, uh, the Brain and Mind Institute here is another sort of great example of that, where, uh, you know, where we begin to think about uh, how our understanding of the brain uh, can feed into how we talk about the mind, uh, which you know, often those two fields are like an entirely different camp. So. so thank you, Nino. I think we have uh, some time for a few other questions, if there are some. This is very much to the, um, the, the, the context of, of the writer or the artist's life. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the artist and the community. Um, at certain stages of artists' lives and, and in certain areas of the arts, visual arts being one, sometimes it feels as if artists are making their art primarily for other artists. And I wonder if you think that that's a useful thing, and also does it change over the life of a writer or an artist of some sort? Um, well, you know, I, it probably does change. Uh, I mean, there's probably a lot of variety out there amongst artists. Uh, uh, there are probably forces that push in, in one direction or the other. Um, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, modernism may have been a bad turn <laughs> in some ways. Uh, uh, I mean, good things came out of it, but it, it, there was, a, there was a, 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 I think, a deeply felt elitism in modernism that in, in some artists, you know, came out in actual fascism, uh, which, which lingers uh, in, in, in contemporary culture. Uh, you know, we still, and, and perhaps particularly in universities, um, uh, you know, this idea of a difference between high and low culture, you know, high is good, low is bad. Uh, you know, those distinctions may be artificial ones, uh, 
you know, my, I've had the experience of, you know, in two programs now of, um, you know, teaching uh, uh, students and, and one by one they come to me and say, well, you know, I submitted a portfolio, they told me not to include genre material, but I really want to write genre. Uh, <laughs> so, so clearly they were being told, well, there's a right kind of thing to write and what you want to write, which is wrong. Uh, and I think that's the wrong message. Uh, I mean, it's a point that, you know, Stephen King makes it in his book on writing that that's what people told him. Why do you want to write this, you know, this fantasy crap, you know, right? But that's what he wanted to write. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and he should be allowed to write it. So if what you want to write is esoteric uh, 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 language-based uh, poetry, that's what you should write. Uh, uh, but I don't think that's what we should necessarily encourage people to write. If they want to write, uh, you know, song lyrics, that's another way of, of, of communicating and, and, and getting out there. And I think we have to, you know, broaden, broaden our sense of, of, uh, of what's acceptable and not kind of, um, again, ghettoize or, or s put into silos these ideas that, you know, if you're not in this uh, inner sanctum, you're not real or good or proper art. The question is still an open one to me. What, you know, how do we define these things? Shakespeare did not want to be, you know, in the inner sanctum. He had to fill those seats and he's still doing pretty well. He's my role model, you know. You could still do something that has impact and yet reach a wide audience. That's the best. That's definitely the, the goal, I think, for, I would think for any artist would be, yeah. like I don't write so that I, it'll, it'll sit in a drawer or be you know, ignored by most people. I'd rather reach most people than be ignored by them. Yeah. Hello, Nino. Uh, in honor of the occasion, I wonder uh, if you could comment on your imaginative relationship between yourself and Alice Munro, especially in the formative years. You've mentioned it in this lecture, and you've mentioned it in the Luminous uh, Writers Anthology, uh -huh. and I think you've said it in person. So if you could embellish on that a little bit. Uh -huh. That'd be awesome. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it is an imaginative relationship in that we have no actual relationship. Uh, <coughs> we have met. We've met twice. Uh, and the first time, she actually spoke to me. Uh, uh, I think what she said was, uh, at some point, you'll reach the point where you can't, you can't trust even your editors to be honest with you. She said that to me, and then she went on. <laughs> <laughs> That just sort of has been hanging in my, I have yet to reach that point. My editors are still perfectly honest with me. But I guess she had reached that point because, uh, probably because, you know, her editors were not up to her level. Um, but as, you know, as a writer, I guess, and it was particularly that, uh, you know, the book Lives of Girls and Women, probably because I read it when I was, when I was fairly young, that, uh, that really uh, stayed with me and that really sort of galvanized me because it was, you know, it was written by someone who came from the same area of the country as I came from, from a, you know, small town, southwestern Ontario, you know, and proved that you could come from small town, uh, western Ontario and still write and write, you know, at the highest level and have stuff to write about. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, beyond that, beyond that content level, just the level of craft the way she, uh, the way she somehow got to emotions that just rang so true to me, but that I would not even have been able to name, you know, until she showed them to me. But you know, uh, uh, you know, little phrases that just uh, sort of helped define whole areas of myself that I hadn't had words. Uh, uh, for before I remember her, uh, you know, one of the stories in, in that collection describing uh, herself out on a date 
uh, pretending to be the person she thought her, her date wanted her to be. You know, a phrase like that, like, oh, so someone else has that feeling too, uh, and, and is able to sort of <coughs> in, in, encapsulate it. Um, um, and, uh, and so much of, you know, what, what she goes through in that, in that book, what the, the, the narrator goes through is also about the formation of, of a writer. Uh, as well, so it, you know, it seemed a kind of blueprint not only for how writers get formed, but but what you know, what's at the bottom of it, uh, what what drives them, and there was a lot in that that uh, that that spoke to me. Um, so, um, yeah, she just uh, she just really helped me see my my own way forward as as a writer and help me to understand how far you can go in the subtle use of language and getting at that thing. You know, she has an essay called What is Real where she talks about a story being a kind of house and there's this room at the center and she can't really tell you what's there. It's just a kind of feeling and the story is really just about trying to make a shape to hold that. Uh, and, you know, my sense of what fiction does uh, uh, really goes to that idea, the idea that there's this kind of unnameable you're trying to get at, and the only way to get at it is by telling the story. That's what story does. Uh, if you could just tell someone what it was, you'd, you know, send them a telegram or whatever. Uh, um, uh, but, you know, stories do that for us, and I understood that, I think, through Alice Munro. So I always thought of you as a novelist, and therefore I was surprised when the Trudeau book came out. Could you talk about how that came to be? Uh-huh. Uh, well, I was approached uh, by, uh, by John Ross Missal, who I knew through our work at Penn, to be part of that series. Uh, and uh, he asked me who I wanted to do, and I'm sure he thought I would pick, I don't know, someone, I don't know, maybe John Cabot, or I don't know, someone from the... Uh, uh, from an ethnic community. I don't know what he had in mind, but, and I immediately said, I want to do Trudeau. Is he taken yet? Uh, and I, I think he was a bit surprised, but, you know, Trudeau for me was, um, um, uh, an, you know, a seminal figure. Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't really follow, follow politics much uh, as a young man. Uh, I don't think I've ever even voted for the Liberal Party. Uh, I mean, I always voted NDP because they, you know, I, I didn't think they were any good either, but they were as far left as I could go at the time. Um, but, um, but something about Trudeau himself, uh, you know, I remember a, a friend of mine doing a, a presentation on Trudeau in, uh, in high school, and, you know, he just captured my imagination at that point, and he, you know, he became this kind of role model for me of what it was possible to be in this country. That I'd never, I'd never seen that kind of a figure around me in other public figures until Trudeau came along. Someone who was educated, who was traveled, who was, uh, 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 you know, wide-reaching in his uh, in his opinions, who had been politically active. Uh, uh, in, in an oppositional way in, in, uh, in Quebec uh, and, um, and who, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, disappointed me as he disappointed many people, uh, but uh, who nonetheless had this complexity to him and this level of contradiction uh, that is exactly what I look for when I'm looking for fictional characters. Uh, so he just had the richness of character that, made him seem like someone would be sort of very interesting to do as, as a, uh, um, you know, biographical treatment. In particular, it wasn't as being asked to do a full biography. It was more a kind of biographical essay and reflection on sort of his impact on my own life as well. Um, um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, usually I try not to think about them because I'm afraid they'll go away. Uh, <laughs> it's only when I give talks like this that I, but um, I don't know. I mean, what is inspiration? Inspiration is, I mean, you only get inspiration when you do the work. Uh, it really, and then you stop doing the work, and then you do the work again. Uh, I mean, often people get inspirations when they, you know, they stop trying to figure out the problem and go for a walk. But it's only because they were trying to figure out the problem. Uh, so, yeah, so that, you know, the initial idea for that, that novel, I mean, there were a thousand other things that went into it that I, you know, couldn't mention. I just watched La Chichara with Sophia Loren, and she was a kind of uh, model for my mother. And I, and I had read Lolita not long before, and she was a kind of model for uh, the other story I was writing. And I mean, there were, you know, a million other strands that, that, that go in there. And then somehow, at some point, somewhere in the brain, usually, you know, in the deep brain, they, they come together. And, and something emerges. Uh, it's very hard to, uh, I mean, so we could call that inspiration. And, and, and in you know, the Greeks thought it came from outside because it often feels that way. It often feels like you know, someone is putting a thought in your head that wasn't there before. Where did it come from? But we now know about the unconscious and, and, and all the work that it does while we're not paying uh, attention, work, uh, that our dreams do, that in putting, making connections that our waking selves don't. Uh, so, I mean, that's, and you need, you need a lot of inspirations, you know, to write a novel. I mean, maybe you get the one big one that, you know, okay, that gets me going. But then it has to happen frequently. Uh, um, um, and, uh, you, you, the only way that happens is by writing a lot, and and usually by writing, you know, that shitty first draft. It's you know it makes such a big difference to do that at the outset to because so because you it's so easy to overthink an idea uh, and to kill it, uh, but you know that that unedited unjudgmental first bout is, is usually the unconscious, uh, I, think, uh, I think one of the books, I think Anne Lamont Thomas, some, or, talks about you know, there's a little guy down there handing stuff up <laughs> to you. Uh, and, and that's how you get it, is by releasing the editing uh, impulse. But it's so hard for us to do that because we're, we're taught otherwise and we, and so many of us believe it has to come out right at the beginning, but it never really does. Uh, you know, and as I tell my students, you, you write you know, 20 pages of crap, and then at the end of it, there's this, an image. And that's it. That's the bit of gold you need to, to get going. But you never would have got there without that 20 pages of crap that was essentially at all the dirt you had to throw off <laughs> to get to that nugget. Does that? <laughs> yes, Nick. That's a really big question. I, yeah. <laughs> I have really expertise. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, yeah, I think it's certainly true that it starts early. You know, I saw this in my son, who was the most curious person in the world. He wanted to know about everything, and then he started school, and bit by bit, you know, I'd see it falling away. And I saw him also ingesting this idea that he, he wasn't smart. Somehow, school taught him, you know, to not be curious, and that he wasn't smart. That's, that's what he learned. In, in his first years of school, uh, so clearly something was going wrong. Uh, or now, you know, the uh, you know we've, they've been testing out this uh, different math approach of you know problem solving versus learning the multiplication tables. And you know, Doug Ford has decided back to the multiplication tables because our scores have been falling. Well, you know, 
they've only been trying the system for a few years. You know, maybe the scores are falling because they're asking the wrong questions. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it's just very hard within the system to actually experiment with more, you know, presumably the idea behind doing more problem solving was to try a more creative approach uh, and a more engaged approach. Uh, but, you know, as soon as there's a bit of failure, it gets shut down. So, I guess we have to be, we have to be willing to risk failure, <laughs> uh, even at the institutional level. Who's going to do that? It takes, you know, governments don't like to do that. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, resources are, are a big part of it. Sure, if you have more teachers, fewer students, more chance for alternative kinds of learning, uh, more of it will happen. Uh, but, you know, there are lots of alternative schools out there that do things differently. Why aren't they the norm <laughs> rather than the alternative? We know how to do it in those schools. Uh, import some of those ideas. Uh, uh, you know, I think an alternative model is to identify that students learn best and do best when they're encouraged to pursue their interests, uh, which doesn't happen in traditional schools, but happens in an alternative environment. So, I mean, there are all kinds of things that can be done, but, you know, whether the will and the resources are there yet, I don't know. Uh, well, it could be, I mean, it could be great. Uh, and it's certainly what I prefer. Um, you know, I much prefer a one on one relationship than a classroom relationship because it allows me not to have to say <laughs> things that might uh, actually kill a, a project, but really just to ask questions and help someone find their, their way. Because, uh, uh, you know, inevitably in a workshop, uh, the writer has to kind of stand back because otherwise they're not really getting, they're not going to get a, a, a valid response, readership response, but, uh, but what I find works much better is them actually talking about what they're trying to do and talking through their own problems, you know, as in therapy, and I don't mean it's therapeutic, but Inevitably, the answers need to come from within them. It's their project. <laughs> They're the only ones who know, really. And they, even they don't know, <laughs> uh, usually, where they're, they're trying to do. So I think there's, there's definitely a lot of room uh, for that, uh, you know, providing. You can get bad mentors, too. That's the danger. And one bad mentor can do a lot more harm than, than a bad workshop. Uh, so. Um, but, you know, ideally that's, that's the best kind of relationship, I think, in a, in a creative situation. So. Maybe with that um, we will wrap it up. I have the honor to thank you, Nino. And I wanted to say that among the wonders of your talk, there was a sense that we moved from the inside at your desk, you madly scrolling through your database. Um, to the outside, and you shared with us the process of writing a novel, but also the reflections on the ways other artists have worked with creativity. And in the midst of all of that, you certainly reminded me of the value of the junk, the stuff, the shit. A friend of mine who's a scientist said in the sciences, you never throw any bad results away because those are results. And I think sometimes in the arts, we think we're only looking for the good results, but I think you've helped convince us that it all matters. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for your questions.